So, Locke is first up on our list of characters to talk about, and thankfully he's quite simple to explain. Each character in Final Fantasy VI has an array of base stats that can help guide players towards what suits each character best. There's no rules saying that you have to make your character a specific way, as it's more of a suggestion, since Final Fantasy VI allows you to customize your characters pretty much as you like. With a few exceptions, of course. I do think it'd be best if I did a quick rundown on each stat for those who might be a little lost right now. First up is HP and MP. These stats are fairly self-explanatory, as they showcase how much health and mana a party member has at any given time. One important thing to note about these two stats, however, is that they are the only ones that will naturally rise as a character gains levels, as every other stat in the game must be raised by some other means outside of that. Next are the stats marked in red. These stats are primarily raised through Magicite. Strength and Magic directly affect the potency of physical and magical actions, respectively. And even if characters can't naturally use magic, like Locke for instance, the magic stat can still aid the character, so don't write it off immediately. Agility helps determine the speed of a character, which can help their ATB bar feel quicker in combat. Stamina raises the potency of heal over time abilities and resistances. If you're someone who doesn't know what Magicite is just yet, don't worry about it right now, but do keep that information in your back pocket. Next are any stats marked in blue. This means that relics and other gear can be used to raise these stats. Now, Locke is a man who focuses primarily on physical attacks, boasting a respectable strength stat and a pretty good selection of weapons giving him a distinct edge over others in combat when it comes down to strictly physical damage. Locke's high speed aids in taking down foes with his hard-hitting attacks that hit quite often as well. Locke also notably has a very good evasion stat, meaning he can dodge incoming attacks quite frequently, and pair that with decent HP, and it will be difficult for enemies to kill him without a fight. Now all of this doesn't come without some drawbacks. For one, physical damage in Final Fantasy VI can be very difficult to put to good use during certain chunks of the game due to enemies having really high physical defenses, which then you would want magic to help pick up the pace when it comes to dealing damage. And well, Locke can't naturally use magic now, can he? In these certain cases, Locke will have a hard time keeping up with those who can use magic or magical attacks better than he can while he just sits around with not much to use his turns on. But this brings me to my personal recommendations on what Magicite and Relics to give Locke to help him have that fighting chance. When it comes to Magicite, due to Locke being more made to dish out physical attacks more than anything, giving him any Magicite that can help boost his strength is definitely worth a mention. It also helps that most of these Magicite also allow Locke to use some very devastating magical attacks that he can fall back on making him more of an all-rounder rather than just a one-trick pony. In terms of relics, there are a mix of early game and end game relics in here, so you won't be able to get your hands on all of these right away, but pretty much all of them are useful for the whole game. Relics like the Hyper Wrist and Gigas Gloves can help boost Locke's base damage, while something like the Master's Scroll can allow Locke to hit multiple times in one action, which can easily crush an enemy in one or two turns. Locke also has a few relics that are unique to him, like the Thief's Bracer or Brigand's Glove. Overall, Locke is a character with the makings of a very powerful damage dealer that is held back by a glaring weakness that haunts him for a considerable amount of time. But next we need to talk about his main gimmick outside of just hitting anything that isn't made of metal really, really hard. That takes us to his special ability, Steal. The name says it all. This ability allows Locke to steal items from an opponent in combat. The chance of success for Steel is based on a few factors, like Locke's current level and the level of the enemy he's trying to steal from, plus any extra bonuses from relics like the Thieves' Bracers. Every enemy in the game has the potential to hold up to two items on their person, with one item being considered a common item while the other being considered to be a rare item. If Locke successfully steals from an enemy, there is a 1 in 7 chance of the item being the rare item with the remaining 7 and 8 chance being the common item. Only one item per enemy can be stolen at a time, meaning that you're going to be rolling the dice on whether or not you'll actually get the item you want from an enemy. There aren't too many enemies in this game that hold super valuable items, but I'll be posting the steal rewards during their boss encounters 
and will make mention of any item that might be worth getting your hands on. The King of Figaro himself, Edgar, is a man who is just as dangerous on the battlefield as he is innovative, boasting a variety of ways to control combat and turn the tides in his favor. But before we look at any of that, let's first go over his base stats. Edgar's stats are fairly well-rounded across the board, with the only major standouts being his defense and stamina. This naturally makes Edgar decently bulky, allowing him to take more hits than the average character. However, this balance in stats isn't to say that Edgar is weak by any means. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Due to the vast amount of options available to Edgar through his gear and tools, he can fit into either being a powerful physical attacker, magic attacker, or even a support character that does everything he can to hinder the enemy in their tracks or aid his allies with buffs. Edgar is a character who can wear heavy armor, which further increases his bulk, but he's also one of the few spear specialists, making him an excellent pick for a jump attack user in the later portions of the game. He is also capable of using some of the most powerful swords in the game, giving him more variety in how you build him if you don't want to rely too much on his tools. But before we talk about his tools, I first want to give my Magicite and Relic recommendations out of the way. Due to the different ways you can build Edgar throughout the game, you really can't go wrong with any Magicite bonus, since Edgar can at least get some mileage out of any of them. But if I were to point you in a specific direction, and also the direction I'll be taking Edgar in this playthrough, I would suggest leaning a bit more on strength bonuses, with a little bit of magic sprinkled in to keep things somewhat balanced. As for gear, Edgar can take advantage of pretty much everything and put it to good use, but I'll give a few highlights. For one, are the Dragoon Boots and Horn, which when equipped, turn the user into a jump attacker, which Edgar can very easily specialize in if you feel like his damage is lacking at any point. Edgar can also find uses out of relics like the Zephyr's Cloak, making him nigh untouchable, capable of playing as the team's anchor, salvaging fights that might have gone wrong. The last one I want to recommend is the Hermes Sandals. Giving Edgar a decent speed boost in combat will really help him keep fights under control with his tools without needing to apply a speed buff beforehand. Now we can finally talk about Edgar's tools. Tools are Edgar's main source of damage and utility for most of the game, and require no resource to use them, meaning that as soon as you get your hands on a tool, they are yours forever and you can use them however much you want. Probably the most important thing I want to mention about tools is that every single tool works as intended regardless of what row Edgar is on, meaning you should almost never, in any circumstance, put Edgar in the front row. That's just unnecessary damage being taken. While I don't want to go over every single tool and their use here, as we'll have plenty of time to get acclimated with them later down the road, I do want to note a few key things about them. One, this is the first instance so far of a character who can't naturally use magic being able to deal magic damage, as Edgar's Bioblaster and later Flash are capable of dealing magical damage to enemies. Also, most tools at Edgar's disposal scale off of his strength and magic stats, meaning that by growing either of those by leveling up is the main way you'll be increasing Edgar's tool damage. This also means that the damage of Edgar's tools might also reach a point where they aren't as reliable anymore, so be sure to have some kind of backup plan in mind for him if tools begin to lag behind in damage. Overall, Edgar is a versatile character that can play many roles in combat, while having one of the most reliable gimmicks in the game. So, Sabin is Final Fantasy VI's monk character, and he's quite an interesting one at that. Generally speaking, Sabin's stats are quite respectable, though he definitely initially excels in strength. This allows Sabin to hit quite hard with his physical attacks from the early portions of the game, and for nearly the rest of the entire game at that. Now, despite this, Sabin's collection of weapons to choose from is actually quite limited, at mostly only being able to use claws which aren't exactly common in Final Fantasy VI. This is sort of a double-edged sword, as it means that keeping Sabin at peak performance is relatively cheap, but it also means that it takes time for him to get any significant bump in damage from gear. 
Now, despite any initial impressions, the main stat that you should focus on growing with Sabin is actually magic and not strength. Now, this is primarily because the best of Sabin's blitz techniques scale off of his magic stat when calculating their potency. So in order to accommodate this, it's recommended to give Sabin any magicite that will aid in boosting his base magic stat, as that will aid in his blitz power as much as possible. Now, you can still grow his strength a little bit if you want to play him as a pure monk, but you probably won't net a similar result compared to just raising magic. Now, this also goes for Sabin's relics as well, as he's going to want to wear relics that aid him in dishing out powerful blitz techniques as often as possible. Notable relics include the Earrings and the Hero's Ring, as both of these are very easy ways of boosting Sabin's magic damage, but I've also provided some options if you want to go the way of the warrior with Sabin. But now, let's talk a bit more about Sabin's Blitz techniques themselves. Blitz allows Sabin to dominate the battlefield with attacks that can hit both physically and magically, giving Sabin quite a bit of diversity when approaching combat. Every single Blitz will be learned by Sabin after reaching a specified level, though there is one case where one can be learned before reaching its intended level. Each Blitz requires a unique input sequence to be activated, and if this sequence is inputted incorrectly, Sabin's action for that turn is used up. Every single Blitz will have the same effect regardless of what row Sabin is currently placed on, so similar to his royal brother, it's best to just keep him in the back row to minimize incoming damage as much as possible. The effects of the Blitz techniques tend to vary, with a good chunk of them being single target attacks on a random foe or an elemental AoE that deals good damage to all enemies. There are also certain Blitzes that can be considered a decent form of healing or utility, but those are normally situational at best. Overall, while having a lackluster selection of gear and a deceptive main stat, Sabin is a strong party member that is easy to excel with while having access to a vast array of powerful attacks that will be consistently useful throughout the entire game's runtime. So, Kayan is quite a straightforward character that has one clear role in combat, charge up and then dish out very powerful attacks on enemies. Aiding in this, we need only look at Kayan's stat block, where he boasts a high strength stat while having one of the worst agility and magic stats in the game. Kayan is going to want to lean heavy into his strength, similar to Locke, if he wants to see any real success on the battlefield. Kayan's selection of weaponry is nothing noteworthy, but it is important to note that he is a specialist in katanas, which do normally come with an added bonus alongside their high damage output. Kayan's armor selection is also fairly decent, being capable of wearing heavy armor to increase survivability, or equipment that can help bring his more lackluster stats like agility or magic higher up. But if I were to give any suggestions on how to build Kayan as a character, I do have a few key notes for you. First, I would highly recommend funneling as many strength bonuses from Magicite at him as possible, as trying to get his magic up to speed is probably not worth it in the long run unless you really want to go against the grain. But that is to say that magic is completely worthless on Kayan, as giving him Magicite that teaches support magic could be a wonderful way of allowing Kayan to fill multiple roles in a party. Physical damage dealers often struggle to deal with enemies that sport high defenses, so giving them the ability to aid the party with buffs and or debuffs can really help them out. In terms of relics, Kayan is going to want to take advantage of any that raise his strength, as that will give the biggest boost to his Bushido damage output. A Genji Glove can give Kayan the ability to go on the offensive with conventional attacks as well, and the occasional bonuses that katanas tend to have can be put to better use there. Now, let's switch gears and talk about Kayan's main ability, Bushido. All Bushido moves are learned as Kayan reaches specific level thresholds or by completing objectives at a certain point in the game. These techniques allow Kayan to unleash a variety of attacks, ranging from counters, attacks that ignore enemy defenses, multi-target flurry attacks, or even a single slice that instantly kills all normal enemies on the field. Now, this all sounds nice, but this power does come at a great cost. Every single Bushido requires Kayan to charge the attack before unleashing it, with the duration of this charge time rising with the level of the Bushido Kayan is attempting to use. 
generally speaking, for Kayan to charge up and use some of his higher level Bushidos, every other party member and enemy on the field will probably have already taken one or two actions, so you'll need to be certain that the Bushido is worth the wait. Generally speaking, speed is Kayan's biggest weakness, leaving him feeling sluggish on the battlefield compared to his allies, and this slowness also plagues Kayan's specialty, which can make playing him frustrating at times. But as with every other character in this game, with the proper gear loadout and the right mindset, Kayan can become the master of combat, capable of cutting everything down in his path. Okay, with Gao here, we have a lot to cover and not a lot of time to do it, so let's just jump right in. Now, as you can see, Gao's stats are fairly unique compared to anyone else we've seen so far, sporting pretty good numbers across the board, including an insane 99 base attack power. Gao is a versatile and capable fighter, being able to mold himself into a pretty strong physical or magical attacker. Due to how his rage gimmick works, which we'll get to in a second, Gao can really fit into any role you want him to. Now that powerful stat spread mainly exists because Gao is a character that cannot naturally equip weapons, outside of very specific circumstances. This means that the only thing you need to really prioritize when it comes to outfitting Gao is boosting his base stats and survivability. This can be achieved by giving Gao armor and relics that raise his evasion or grant him resistances. In fact, Gao might be the character that benefits the most from gear that reduces the damage of elemental attacks or grants ailment immunities. The reason behind this is tied to his rage system, so keep this information in your back pocket for now. But before we talk about rage, let's quickly go over what you should have Gao invest in magicite wise Because Gao can go either way when it comes to physical or magical damage, it really comes down to player preference on what you want Gao to do. Personally speaking, I think it is much easier to set Gao up to be a strong physical attacker, as it allows us to make use of that 99 attack power without the need for purchasing and managing weapons. Gao's more powerful rages also tend to lean more on the physical side, so that will complement this well. Not really much else to say, building Gao is the easy part, as the more complicated part of Gao lies with his leap and rage system. Now, because I don't want to be stuck here talking about this feral youth until the heat death of the universe, I am going to give you all the abridged explanation of these abilities, and then let the character speak for himself from that point on. Now, while I think the Kappa did a pretty decent job explaining how Gao's leap works in the Velt, Rage is going to require a bit more of an explanation. The Rage action allows Gao to use the abilities of the enemies he has found in the Velt. When you activate Rage, Gao will become uncontrollable and will begin to act on his own until he's either KO'd or combat ends. Gao will also take on any elemental factors and status immunities or weaknesses that the enemy he has channeled with Rage had. This is why giving Gao relics that can aid in raising his defense and resistances is so important, as what he's weak to will be constantly changing. Each Rage that Gao can learn has its own attack, with some being attacks or spells that other characters can learn like Fire or Thunder, while others are completely unique to that enemy. Now because there are well over 200 different enemies that grant Gao a new rage, instead of going over every single one of them right now, I am instead going to show off an image of some of the more well-known rages that players can make use of. Overall, Gao is an incredibly complex character that requires a lot of time and commitment to have his strengths become fully realized, which can also make him a pain to play around in casual playthroughs. Despite this, even with just a little bit of effort, Gao can become a mainstay in your party thanks to his simple game plan and easy to understand gear setup. So, Celeste marks our first time going over a natural magic user in one of these bios, so let's get to know her and her abilities a bit better. Celeste has a very balanced stat spread along with a good selection of armor to choose from, making her capable of fulfilling multiple roles in the party at once. Not to mention that, similar to Terra, Celeste will learn magic automatically as she levels up, which while it might not make too much of a difference, this does mean Celeste can also be easier to build due to this. As she was once a general of the Gestalian Empire, Celeste is well versed in combat, 
being capable of wielding powerful swords that give her the ability to take on any enemy regardless of defense. And as I said earlier, Celeste's options for equipment aren't lacking either, as she can wear heavy armor to increase her defenses, put on gear that raises her offense to an even higher level, or slot on evasion increasing gear to make her a nearly untouchable support caster. When it comes to raising Celeste's stats with Magicite, due to her versatility, you really can't go wrong with anything. Leaning fully into either magic or strength would probably be the obvious choice, since Celeste can excel well in both professions. But it isn't a bad idea to consider striking a balance between the two and have Celeste perform as sort of a jack-of-all-trades type of character. The choice is ultimately up to you, but my magicite and gear recommendations are presented as if you were aiming to balance her magic and strength. In terms of relics, there aren't really any key standouts that Celeste might want in particular, but if you intend to make her a full magic user, the Soul of Thamasa should probably be a high priority due to it allowing the caster to cast two spells in one turn, which is quite helpful for finishing fights quickly or supporting your allies. I haven't really mentioned Celeste's main ability Runic at all yet, have I? Well, let's go ahead and talk about it. Runic allows Celeste to absorb incoming magic into herself, mitigating the magic's effects and regenerating MP for Celeste based on how much it costs to cast the spell absorbed. This can easily be used to shut down enemies who are capable of using magic, as Celeste can render them incapable of using magic to harm the party, which is quite the power if I do say so myself. However, it is very important to note that when Celeste uses Runic, she will absorb the next magic spell cast regardless of its source, and that includes your party. This means that Runic might accidentally blunder a potential attack or healing spell that your party sends out, wasting the caster's action and the Runic use. Also, while fairly niche, I do want to mention that if Runic absorbed an elemental spell while having an item that allows her to normally absorb that magic as HP, the effect will backfire and drain Celeste's MP instead of regenerating it. Runic in general is a decently useful ability that will require careful consideration on when to use it, as it could very easily trivialize a tough battle or completely cripple your team depending on how you use it. Overall, though, Celeste is a character that brings a lot to any party she's put on, and thanks to the variety of weapons, armor, and magic at her disposal, she can easily find herself as a mainstay no matter how you build her. So, we can finally go over the character that started it all, Terra. As we already know, Terra is a character that boasts a balanced stat spread with a general focus in magic, making her a prime candidate for dishing out powerful magic attacks or providing heals to the party. Now, similar to Celeste, which is something that rings true with pretty much the entirety of Terra's kit, Terra has access to a wide array of equipment options, ranging from powerful swords to useful armor that can help boost her stats to higher levels than they already are. Because of this, it is really up to the player to decide how Terra will fit into the party, as she could really do anything you want her to do at least somewhat well. Also, as we've already seen in the playthrough, Terra will learn certain magic spells naturally as she levels up, so if you're trying to be very precise on what magic that you give her, you'll know what magic to not waste time learning. And speaking of Magicite, let's move on to some recommendations. Personally speaking, I usually tend to lean towards giving Terra more magic-focused Magicite to help boost her magic stat, while also giving her more options for damage and support. But similar to Celeste, you can't go wrong handing her a sword, pointing her at the enemy, and saying go crazy. It really does come down to personal preference, but if I were to make a suggestion, whatever you didn't decide to focus with Celeste, be it physical or magical, have Terra focus on that, so you weren't doubling up on one strategy. While it is perfectly fine to have two powerful sword users or two powerful magic casters, it might be easier to manage only one of each due to a limited supply of equipment options for the majority of the game. In terms of relics, Terra is going to want the standard magic increasing relics like earrings, hero's ring, and whatnot, but in the later portions of the game, relics like the Soul of Thamasa or Celestriad will come in handy, as they will allow Terra to just mow down enemies left and right with ease. The Gigas Glove can also prove useful if you intend to go down the physical attacker path with Terra. Now let's go ahead and move on to Terra's newly acquired ability, Trance. When activated, Terra transforms into her Esper form, and her ATB gauge will begin depleting at a predetermined rate. When the gauge depletes fully, Terra will return to her human form. 
While in Esper form, Terra's physical and magical damage output will be doubled, and her magic defense will also be doubled. This allows Terra to deal an incredible amount of damage as soon as she gets access to this ability, making her one of the best characters to bring when going up against tanky enemies and bosses. The duration of Trance is a little tricky to understand if you don't really go out of your way to test things, so I'll do my best to explain it here. Every time you obtain AP from combat, that AP is put into a hidden Trance counter inside of the game's code. Once the counter reaches 16 points, Trance becomes available for use. This counter can go up as high as 255 points, with the higher the count giving a longer Trance duration. Once the Trance gauge is used up in combat, this hidden AP counter will reset from zero, and you'll begin the process all over again. This hidden AP counter has no effect on the AP you use to learn magic, so don't worry about losing AP or anything like that when using Trance. They are two separate systems. This means of gaining time while in Trance is mostly made to keep you from spamming it too often, so just make sure you continue to have Terra in battles, win them, gain AP, and then use Trance when you really need to, like boss battles. All in all, Terra is a very easy character to understand. Big damage numbers, awesome selection of weapons and armor, and a powerful ability that does nothing but improve upon what Terra already does well. A very powerful character that will excel at anything you want her to. The iconic Final Fantasy mascot has a representative in this game, and boy is he an interesting one indeed. Starting off by looking at his stats, Mog is unlike any other party member we've come across so far. The quality of his stats seem very off at first glance, from having abysmal strength, though conversely having a wonderful attack stat, or the fact that Mog, due to his stature, one would assume that he wouldn't be able to take a hit, when that couldn't be further from the truth. And this extends into Mog's weapon of choice, the Spear, which is very uncommon to see a specialist for in Final Fantasy VI. This means that if you want Mog to perform well in the conventional damage department, slotting him as the party's go-to jump attacker would be the way to go thanks to the damage bonus granted by Spears when jumping. Mog's choice of defensive equipment is also quite interesting, as he can wear certain pieces of heavy armor, granting him more defense, while also having powerful gear that is exclusive to him. And seeing how his dance ability works, you might even see yourself changing out Mog's weapons and armor around quite frequently to adjust to your surroundings. Generally speaking, Mog's role in the party really comes down to whether or not you are willing to play ball, so to speak, with his abilities and gear options, as they are definitely more of a factor than other characters. When discussing stat bonuses for Magicite, Mog is one of those characters that can't really go wrong with any of them. If you intend for him to become a jump specialist, then strength should be your primary focus, but otherwise you are sort of free to build him as you choose. Relics are also pretty straightforward. Dragoon Boots and Horn for a jump setup is an obvious choice, with the Earrings and Heroes Ring being good options for when Mog wants to dance. Equipping the Zephyr Cloak can't hurt either, as it'll make the little guy take even longer to take down. Now let's move on to talking about Mog's special ability, Dance. Dancing allows Mog to access a series of special moves that are themed around the type of dance Mog is currently doing, ranging from powerful single-target attacks, ailment cleansing effects, to strong party-wide healing spells. When dancing, Mog cannot be normally controlled, similar to when Gao is under the effect of rage, so you need to be sure of which dance you want Mog to perform before you dedicate him to doing it until combat ends or he's KO'd. Each dance can be acquired by finishing battles while in different terrain with Mog in your party. Every time Mog tries to begin a dance, there is a 50% chance of failure. However, if Mog performs a dance that complements the terrain it hails from, the dance will never fail to begin. And as stated earlier, once a dance has begun, Mog will not stop. Now there's quite a selection of dances to choose from, but honestly, they're all at least somewhat decent. There aren't really any bad ones in my personal opinion, but without going into too much detail, generally matching Mog's dances to the terrain you're battling in is a good idea. Though if you're running into problems with enemies absorbing Mog's dance damage or his dances just aren't cutting it, the dance Water Harmony or Wind Rhapsody are generally going to be your best choices since they both have strong party-wide healing spells and pretty good damage output. Overall though, if dancing isn't cutting it at all, 
Mog can perform just as fine as a Dragoon, jumping onto enemies and dealing a pretty good chunk of damage throughout the entirety of the game. Though this is to say that Mog has no shortage of options when it comes to fitting into a party. So just go with what works and have at it. So, Setzer, quite an interesting individual if I do say so myself. Not only is he a world-renowned gambler, but he's also a fairly experienced fighter. So, diving into Setzer's stats, honestly, they aren't all that impressive. Setzer lacks any real specialization, like strength or magic, and doesn't have the greatest base stats for defense either. Now, normally this would be a bit of a problem, but thankfully, Setzer does have a few tricks up his sleeve that keeps him from struggling to keep up with the rest of the cast. For example, Setzer is a character that has the luxury of being able to equip heavy armor, which can come in handy in catching Setzer's poor defense stats up to speed with his fellow party members. Setzer also has a vast array of unique weapons that all deal decent to amazing damage and ignore the road damage penalty. Now, obviously, some of Setzer's weapons do rely on chance to deal decent damage like his dice, but if you aren't confident in your luck, then outfitting Setzer to be a decent magic user isn't a bad idea either. And speaking of magic, let's go ahead and take a look at some of the Magicite and Relic recommendations for Setzer real quick. From my own personal experience, raising Setzer's magic and trying to diversify his magical repertoire has always been my go-to option, as Setzer has more than a few ways of dealing decent damage without the need for any strength enhancements. I would say, focus on boosting Setzer's MP base count, and then teach him as many support spells as you want, since this will give him the ability to fall back as the party's healer or support caster if need be. In terms of relics, most of Setzer's options until endgame are fairly lacking, Giving Setzer a Hero's Ring and some form of ailment nullification is probably the best call. Also, while I don't find it particularly useful, Setzer does have a unique relic called the Heiji's Jite, which will turn Setzer's slot's ability into Gil Toss, dealing damage to enemies based on how much Gil was thrown. I personally don't think it's that good, but if you're looking for a completely different playstyle for Setzer, this could be the way to go. Now we move on to Setzer's special ability, Slots. When using slots, you'll be shown a slot machine window that has multiple symbols in each slot. By pressing A, each slot, starting from the left, will stop on a specified image shown in the middle of the window. Depending on what symbols you have in what order, a variety of effects can occur, from pretty much nothing at all, some decent AoE damage, summoning a random Esper out of nowhere, or if your luck turns against you, killing all of your allies. This ability is all about gambling after all. But despite that, Setzer's slots are actually more skill-oriented than one might think initially. So in Final Fantasy VI, the way that slots work is that depending on what you're fighting, there are times where the slots can be rigged against or even in your favor, keeping you from using certain slots or pushing you towards a certain combination that could really help you in that moment. Now this situation, especially rigging slots against you, normally only applies to specific encounters like a boss fight but in every other case, the slots are just going to be normal. So, if you're feeling like pissing off any casino known to man, we could always try to rig the game in our favor. Each slot combination has a set timing to it, ranging from very easy to learn to outright brutal, but everything can be learned. Using the pause feature that comes with almost every version of Final Fantasy VI, you could easily check to see if you're hovering over a slot that you want, and then mash A as soon as you close the menu to lock in that slot. With enough practice, you could be manipulating luck itself to aid you in most battles without any real risk whatsoever. But ultimately, this is the biggest hurdle with Setzer. If you really want to get the most out of him and his special ability for the majority of the game, it is going to require a good amount of effort, and that might not be worth it whenever you could lower the risk of playing with Setzer by giving him some reliable attack options and support tools instead. As always though, it is up to you if that reward is worth the risk and the time. Strago is an interesting old fella, as he's capable of casting magic that no one else can, while also being incapable of learning normal magic when leveling up. It's weird, but not that big of a deal. Anyways, let's talk about his stats real quick. Strago has a decent stat spread, with magic being a standout positive, but the others leave something to be desired. A slow, but decently tanky magic caster isn't a bad thing initially, 
but it does mean that you should either dedicate gear and relics to bringing them up to speed with the others, pun not intended, but now it is, or maybe even using some of his Magicite bonuses to boost him a bit. In terms of gear, Strago's weapon of choice is the Rod. Rods normally have unique effects tied to them, but they aren't generally used for direct combat, meaning that Strago is going to need to fall back on magic more often than any other character that we've seen so far. His armor options, on the other hand, are wonderful, as he can equip the Suit Armor Type, which grant a multitude of stat buffs and extra effects like Poison Immunity. General rule of thumb with the old man here is to keep him in the back row and cast magic all day long. Moving on to Strago's Magicite growth, as you've probably guessed, magic is going to be the main focus for him, as he is going to want to be casting spells as often as possible. However, raising his speed even just a tiny bit will work wonders in giving Strago a good chance at moving before the enemy can rip into him. And thanks to Strago's simple game plan, giving him relics is also quite easy, as he will want anything that can help him raise his magical prowess or boost his speed in combat, so earrings and hermy sandals should probably be the first on your list to nab for him. Lastly, we have Strago's special ability, Lore. This ability allows Strago to learn a variety of unique spells from the enemies he encounters in battle, ranging from simple attack spells, level-based magic and ailments, to powerful defensive spells that aid the entire party. In order for Strago to learn lore magic, he needs to participate in a battle with the enemy who uses the lore spell you are trying to learn. Strago must be alive and not under the effect of any ailment when the spell is cast. Then, once combat concludes, Strago will have learned the lore for himself. Even if Strago is KO'd when combat concludes, as long as he was perfectly fine when the spell went off, he will learn it. Now, Strago's lore magic is different from something like Gao's Rages, as lore magic works just like standard magic would, requiring MP and can be cast at any point without any kind of catch. Because the lore magic is tied to fighting enemies, there are cases where obtaining certain spells requires an extra trick or strategy in order to obtain, like confusing the enemy, or just having Strago present for certain story objectives at the right time. The viability of lore magic tends to vary from not very useful to incredibly valuable, so if you just wish to look through a list of all of the possible lore abilities Strago can learn, and where to find them, if you intend to just pick and choose which ones to grab and what not to, I will leave a link to a page where you can find all of the spells in the description of this video. I personally really enjoy Strago and the Blue Mage archetype in general, and thankfully he is fairly straightforward to build and play with, but he does require a decent amount of commitment to take advantage of what makes him unique from all of the other powerful magic casters like Terra, Celeste, and even his own granddaughter who we'll get to at a later date. Don't sleep on this old man's potential. You might find yourself pleasantly surprised. Realm is quite straightforward to understand, as she is similar to her grandfather in many ways, focusing mostly on being a pure magic caster without much use anywhere else. But where Strago brings a diverse array of spells through his lore ability, Realm instead boasts an insane magic stat that can make her a prodigy at any form of magic you give her. It is important to note that Realm will not learn magic as she levels up, despite being a natural user of magic, so you'll need to dedicate some time to help her learn some magic if you want her to shine in your party as soon as possible. Looking at her gear and stat loadout, there really isn't much to say here that hasn't been already said about Strago. Elemental Rods are an excellent weapon of choice for her, especially early on when she doesn't have any direct access to powerful magic, and the Suit Armor type will help bring up any other stats that she has that seem to be lacking. Like her grandfather, Realm is going to see most of her success as a pure magic caster, so giving her Magicite that will not only raise her magic even further, but will bestow powerful spells along with it will be what she is looking for. If you feel like Realm is getting KO'd too often, Taking a few levels to boost her HP could also be a good option, but I personally have never really seen the need for this. In terms of relics, pieces like the Zephyr's Cloak and Memento Ring are going to be good picks, as they will keep Realm out of harm's way from damage and ailments. Giving Realm the Celestriad and Soul of Thamasa will also give her the ability to go full on Battle Mage and sweep enemies left and right. 
but that also might be just a little bit overkill. Now, if Realm has the potential to be this powerful with just magic, her special ability must be even better, right? Well, I'm sure Sketch has the power to strike fear into any SNES cartridges, but that's pretty much it. When Realm sketches an enemy on the field, she will use one of two attacks based on the enemy she has drawn. If the move she uses does damage, the potency of the attack will be based on Realm's current level and the stats of the enemy being hit. This means that the damage being dealt is going to vary wildly, and will be more often than not quite lacking compared to the other options like just casting magic that she can bring. Realm's Sketch is better off used as a means of helping Strago learn lore spells, as there are specific cases where Realm's Sketch is needed to get some of them, but other than that, I would only advise using Sketch if you really want to give Realm a different playstyle from the quickly growing array of playable magic users. If Realm is wearing a fake mustache, Realm's Sketch will become Control, allowing her to completely take over an enemy, giving the player access to their moveset during combat. Control will be broken if the enemy dies or Realm is hurt, so be mindful of any remaining enemies on the field when using Control. Similar to Sketch, Control will help Strago learn annoying lore spells, but won't have much practical use other than that and giving Realm something unique to do in combat. Do note that both Sketch and Control won't work on certain enemies, so be prepared to have Realm defend herself if her special abilities are found to be lacking in combat. All in all though, Realm joins the team as a somewhat decent caster and rod user that just needs a little push in the right direction with some good magic, in which she becomes an immensely powerful little gremlin of death. And yes, while her abilities aren't anything crazy, they can be good fun if you are feeling like trying something new outside of just casting the same attack spells over and over again, or if you intend to break your SNES cartridge. It's been a while since we've had a new character to talk about, and Umaro is definitely worth discussing, as he is vastly different from anyone else in the cast. It's best to first talk about his stats, as he does actually have a pretty decent showing here, especially in his strength. But while this is fine and dandy, Umaro does have a few major quirks that make him stand out amongst the rest, for better or for worse. First, Umaro cannot equip weapons or armor, always being outfitted with his Bone Club and Snow Scarf. This makes raising his defenses or granting elemental and status immunities quite difficult, but thankfully you can still give the Yeti some relics. And in terms of relics, Umaro does have a few unique ones like the Berserker Ring and Blizzard Orb, and while the orb isn't really all that useful, the Berserker Ring can still find some good use out of Umaro, giving him some new moves in combat. Equipping other relics like the Hyper Wrist, Gigas Glove, or Hero's Ring also does the trick in boosting Umaro enough to pull his weight in combat. Though there is one more major difference about Umaro that really hurts him. He cannot equip Espers or learn magic. This really limits how you can play with Umaro, since he'll be stuck using the same basic moves over and over again, while not allowing you to use him to strategize with a party. No support or magic attacks to fall back on, no raise or cure spells to aid injured teammates, just a few basic attacks and a dream. So, because of this, generally speaking, you're going to want to build Umaro to be very strength-focused and deal very powerful physical attacks. If this very simple playstyle interests you, then go right ahead. But Umaro doesn't really do it for me, honestly. But now let's quickly move on to the third thing that sets Umaro apart from the rest, in that of his special ability, Berserk. Now, this is technically called Rage, but for the sake of keeping Gao and Umaro's abilities separate from each other and not being called the same name, I will be calling Umaro's ability Berserk. Now, Berserk is actually activated as soon as combat begins, rendering you incapable of issuing Umaro commands for the entire fight. Under the effect of Berserk, Umaro will use one of two moves, and up to four if the Berserker Ring and or Blizzard Orb are equipped. These moves are a basic attack, and a physical attack named Tackle, with another physical attack named Throw Ally being added on if the Berserk Ring is equipped, and an Ice spell named Snowstorm if the Blizzard Orb is equipped. Because everything Umaro does is mostly random, it can be actually quite difficult to rely on him to deal consistent damage, or to even just function like a normal party member, as he generally lacks the synergy that every other team member brings to the party. 
Now, of course, this doesn't mean that Umaro isn't without his uses, as he can still deal respectable damage with very little setup needed, and his automation means you only really need to manage three other active party members during combat, lessening the potential stress of active battles. But this still doesn't really get rid of the fact that Umaro is a fairly late game character that lacks any real form of customization, leaving him in a weird limbo spot in the party lineup. If he's a character that interests you, then you absolutely have the means to use him well. Just be ready to have other teammates pick up where he falls very, very short. Alrighty, we can finally discuss Shadow without worrying about him leaving our team abruptly, as he is now permanently on our side. Now, I've already talked about Shadow in some detail throughout the playthrough when he would join our team temporarily, so I'll try to keep this bio as brief as possible. Firstly, looking at Shadow's stats, we can see that he has a solid spread across the board with excellent speed and evasion stats, granting him the ability to act quickly while also being able to dodge incoming attacks fairly reliably. Now, one thing that Shadow does sort of lag behind in is equipment options. As while he has a pretty decent spread of gear to choose from, it really isn't anything great, leaving him in a spot where he is going to want to rely on his evasion heavily since one good hit on him might spell a quick end if he isn't well prepared for it. In terms of weapons, Shadow specializes in daggers, which normally have special effects attached to them to make up for their lack of firepower. Though, honestly speaking, Shadow's weapon of choice matters very little, as his throwing ability is probably going to be your go-to option for damage on Shadow anyways. Moving on to Magicite and Relics, Shadow is another character that can sort of be raised to be whatever you want him to be. His balanced stats allow for him to play well into any role from the get-go, but if you intend to lean him in one direction or the other, I would suggest Strength, as Shadow's throw damage does scale primarily with his strength, with certain exceptions like scrolls scaling off of magic. Regarding relics, giving Shadow the means to raise his evasion even higher or boost his throw damage should probably be priority number one. Relics like the Zephyr Cloak and Prayer Beads are wonderful for allowing Shadow to evade incoming attacks, while the standard Hyper Wrist, Earring, or Earrings, and Hero's Ring come to mind when looking to boost his attack power when throwing items. Now we move on to Shadow's special ability, and one we've already become fairly acquainted with by now, Throw. Throw allows Shadow to toss certain weapons and items at his opponents, dealing double the damage of that weapon, and ignoring factors like defense and evasion, with the exception of any elemental affinities the enemy might have. Throwing weapons or items like shurikens will scale off of Shadow's strength when factoring damage, and can come in handy when going up against pretty much any enemy as they will ignore physical defense, unlike a standard attack. Scrolls are also another type of throwable item, where a certain effect will activate based on the type of scroll it is, ranging from magic damage from items like a water scroll, or giving Shadow a buff like the invisibility scroll. All throwable items are used up once they have been thrown, meaning that you want to be careful not to throw that shiny new sword you just got if you intend to use it at any point, because once you give it to the homicidal ninja to chuck at a random bird, it's gone for good. Overall though, Shadow is a solid character that only has one major flaw in my opinion, and that is he doesn't officially join your team until pretty late into the game. Thankfully, Thoreau does allow Shadow to sort of carry his weight in a fight, as you scramble to fit any potential magic or stat buffs onto him. He's a simple character to understand and play around, and that makes him a solid pick for almost any team composition. We have finally made it to our final character to go over, and Gogo is one interesting individual to end off on. Looking at Gogo's stats, we can see that they are very balanced, not having any real specializations, and that's for a good reason, as this balance allows for Gogo to slot into any role they need to be in without the fear of lagging far behind their allies. In terms of equipment, Gogo is limited in what weapons they can bring, mainly being rods and daggers. Because of this, Gogo is most likely going to want to take advantage of the stat boosts of these weapons, rather than relying on them for raw damage. Gogo's armor choices aren't anything special either, mostly wanting gear that help boost their stats in various ways to fit the party members they are going to be mimicking at any given time. Now, similar to Amaro, Gogo is unable to equip and learn magic from espers, 
meaning that they also don't gain any stat bonuses upon leveling up. So you'll need to mind Gogo's gear options a little bit more carefully to help catch them up to speed. Now this isn't to say that Gogo can't use magic or that they are in general weak, but it does mean that Gogo's progression is quite different from the rest of the cast. When it comes to relics, Gogo can't really go wrong with any combination of relics, and due to Gogo's jack of all trades in nature, it is difficult for me to give you any direct recommendations myself, so play it by ear and choose what relics you think would fit Gogo the best for the current situation you're faced with. Now we move on to the star of the show, Gogo's special ability, Mimic. Mimic allows Gogo to use the most recent action taken by a party member, be it an attack, using an item or spell, or even using their ally's own special abilities as well. This can be a little difficult to control on the fly, but thankfully, Gogo comes with their own unique ability to equip, so to speak, up to three different actions alongside their mimicry. Now, these actions range from being able to just use items normally or magic, to being able to utilize Bushido arts, blitz techniques, or even being able to cast runic on themselves. Being able to slot these actions onto themselves whenever they want is what allows Gogo to slide their way into any team composition, even if they may not be able to perform as well as the original holders of these abilities. The options themselves are worth it enough. Overall though, Gogo is a very interesting character with a great deal of potential that is really only held back by how late they show up in the game and the player's imagination. I fully encourage you to try out Gogo for yourself, as they might surprise you with just how fun they can be when a little bit of creativity is used to spice up your party.